On today's show, Bucks Fizz star Cheryl Baker talks about why she needed no help making her mind up when it came to her marriage. He didn't go on his hands and knees. Well, he wouldn't go on his hands and knees, he just got on his knee, even one knee. He just, <laughs> his, his hands and knees, that's a different game altogether. <laughs> Plus, superstar designer Elizabeth Emanuel talks about that infamous dress. Finally, I picked up the phone, and it was Diana. And uh, she just sort of said, would you do me the honor of making my wedding dress? And it was um, as if time stood still. It was, you know, like one of those life-changing moments. Rita. Everyone still calls me Rita. The funny thing is that Steve worked with me and knew me as a mate for 12 years and he called me Cheryl in all that time. And then when we started going out together, he said, I'm not going to call you Cheryl anymore, I'm going to call you Rita. And that was that. Isn't it bizarre? I became um, a professional singer in 1975. That was the first band I ever joined. It was called Mother's Pride. And the guy who was in that band had a girlfriend, not a girlfriend, but a girlfriend who had a boyfriend. And that was Steve Stroud. And I became really good friends with her. She was lovely. She introduced me to Steve and he was really friendly and he bought us a drink and that was that. And I went to see his band again a few times because they were really good and I was so loved music. But oh, there's Mike Nolan followed by Colin Northover, who used to do all our sound. And then, coincidentally, he joined a band called Sparrow. Our paths used to cross all the time then, even more so, you know. And we'd be in a venue in Manchester, and they'd be in the venue at the end of the road, because there were an awful lot of live gigs in the 70s. And so, on our night off, we'd go and see Sparrow, and Sparrow would come and see Coco, and, and I'd see it, and he'd talk to me, and he'd talk to me about Jenny, and how she's not the right girl for him, and me, you know, I never ever thought, oh, he's, he's trying to pull me because I was so green, so naive. And I used to say to him, no, you, you need to persevere because she's such a lovely girl. And, and oh, I didn't realise there were so many photographers there. Twelve years after first meeting Steve in 1975, I suddenly saw this beautiful, fabulous, lovely man who was kind, who was considerate, who was generous, I don't mean by money, I mean in time and in um, emotion. And I just looked at him and thought, why haven't I seen anything in Steve before? He's lovely. I've had all these other relationships. I've been engaged a few times and Steve was always there with the shoulder for me to cry on when something went wrong. And in 1987, I rang him and I said, Steve, I need to talk to you. There's something on my mind, you know, and, and it involves you. And he went, all right, sure, don't worry. And he came straight round and... We went out for a meal, and, um, and I said, I, I like you more than I ought to, because we're mates. And he went, no, no, you can't, you know. If, if it all goes wrong, if it all goes pear-shaped, then we lose our friendship, as well as a possible relationship. But um, I wouldn't take no for an answer. And here we are, been married 15 years. This is me. I'm in the, the vintage car, me and my dad. I was nervous, but he was terribly nervous, my dad. And there's all these Bucks Fizz fans. There were, there were so many Bucks Fizz fans there. And I did recognise an awful lot of them. Um, and in all my wedding photos, they're all in the background. <laughs> and it's one time when you think, no! <laughs> the problem for Steve and I was that, although I had the hots for him and I really wanted us to get together and try and make a go of it, um, I was already in a relationship. I was engaged, in fact, and living with someone and had been for six years. And Steve was in a long-term relationship as well. My fiancé was the drummer in the Bucks Fizz band and Steve was the bass player and they were buddies. Um, so this was going to be difficult for us. So actually, we were together for two years without anyone knowing. We kept it all very secret. Uh, after two years, we, I said to my previous fiancé, look, you know, there is someone else, you have to leave the house. And he said, I don't care who it is, as long as it's not Steve Stroud. Well, he's lovely, my husband, isn't he? Our first date was October the 17th, and Steve asked me to marry him three Christmases later, so it was 
two years and a few months later, Christmas Day, and his family were coming over. There would be 11 of us sitting down to dinner. And then we'd opened all the presents, and he said, oh, there's one more in the tree. And it was a little box, and I thought, oh, is it what I think it is? And I was, I was praying that it was, I really was. I'd been engaged three times before, but I think the three times before had only been because, well, I suppose it felt right at the time, but I never, ever felt I'm going to marry this person. Whereas with Steve, I wanted him to be my husband. I really wanted him to be my lifetime partner, you know. And so I opened this box and it was an engagement ring and I was just made up, made my life. I gave it a bit of thought. No, I said yes. Of course I said yes. Yeah. He didn't go on his hands and knees. Well, he wouldn't go on his hands and knees, he just got on his knee, he wouldn't he? One knee. He just, <laughs> his, his hands and knees, that's a different game altogether. <laughs> this, is the, um, this is the dress that my friends made me on my hen night. I didn't want a hen night where you just go to the pub and get blathered. I said, and I didn't want presents. I mean, we'd been, Steve and I had lived together, we had our own homes, we didn't need an, another toaster. So I said, to my girlfriends, let's just go to a hotel and stay the night and just be girls, be mates and have a lovely time and that's what we did. But they made me this lovely dress saying things like, comes with a carrot. Oh, I just realised what that says. <laughs> I just, I just realised the implication. <laughs> I love huge willies. I never really read all, all these, exciting but frisky. Steve comes from quite a small family. He's an only child, his dad's an only child, his mum was one of three sisters. Doesn't have many aunts and uncles, doesn't have hardly any cousins, so very, very small. I'm one of five, mum was one of 11, dad was one of 11. All the brothers and sisters of my parents' families had big families. So we were looking at either really small, intimate, just immediate family or really big. It had to be one or the other. There was no in-between. And so we had really big. It was more my decision than Steve's, I must say. I think Steve would rather have saved the money and, you know, had a really good honeymoon, which we had anyway. But um, it was expensive, but it was really worth it. It was fabulous. We got married on Blackheath in South London. There's a beautiful church there called All Saints. And it's like... Um, it's like a chocolate box. It's just perfectly built and it's got a lovely spire and, and I really wanted to get married there. We had, we had our wedding there and then we had our wedding reception at uh, Blackheath Concert Halls, which again, inside, was a fabulous venue and it needed to be able to take about 500 people, which it did comfortably. I'm not a very starry person. The f my friends in show business are friends. They're not friends because they're showbiz, it's just coincidental. Um, Gary Rhodes I class as a friend. Peter Howitt, who was the original Joey in Bread, who's now a fabulous director. Mike Nolan, Shelley Preston and Bobby G was there from Buck Spheres. And that was it. it was, although it was a massive wedding, it was family and friends, and really good friends. And so I didn't feel like I was trying to impress anyone. I didn't care whether the pictures went into OK or hello. I just cared that my special day was with my special people. I particularly wanted uh, a church wedding, not because I'm religious, um, but because, actually for the wrong reasons really, because I wanted to wear a lovely dress and because I wanted my dad to walk me down the aisle. My dad was in his mid-70s, but he had been very poorly at the time and I really wanted him to walk me down the aisle because I thought he would be the proudest dad and he was a proud dad, proud of all of his kids. Despite what I did, he was as equally as proud of my brother who worked for you know, British Telecom and my sister who had a clothes shop. You know what I'm saying? It was, he was just a typical proud father. What I didn't remember was my sister said to me, after I'd had my dress made, I had it made, helped with the design and everything. <laughs> this is the cape. Oh, it smells of clothes that haven't been out for years. Do you know, she said, you, you drew that dress when you were a little girl and you said that's going to be my wedding dress. It's ever so heavy. I think I took this off. Did I take it off? I can't remember. Oh. <laughs>
the dress was cream. I mean, let's face it, I was 37 when I got married. There's no way I could have worn white. Uh, we went for um, wintry colours. We went for those sort of crimsons and dark greens and golds, that, the kind of thing that you decorate your Christmas tree with. And it was all roses that, it sounds dreadful, but it was stunningly beautiful. Working with Steve for all those years, he was Jack the Lad, and I used to think, I used to watch him, and he'd be like a different girl on every, in every venue that we played on tour, and I used to think, oh, poor girl who ends up with Steve Stroud. And it was me. Up next. I've always loved designing for weddings because my, my style is very feminine very romantic and it's the ultimate expression of all of that in a wedding dress. I've always been into fashion actually, even going back through my old books and things, I'll see little doodles um, of you know, girls wearing sort of big frocks and things. I've always kind of been into that. But at college, I actually studied uh, illustration I was into, um, art in general. And I really did want to go into illustration. But then they decided that there wasn't any space on the course. So I ended up going on to the fashion course. And then once I got sucked into that, you know, that was it. And uh, I was at Harrow, very, very good college. I had to be very disciplined, they worked you very hard and stood me in good stead really to get into the Royal College of Art because it's really difficult to get in, into there. I know we don't, we don't want to cut this piece yet, so it's, um, but at least we can get a, a feel of how it might look. Dave and I were just always decided when we graduated that we would start up our own business and we were very fortunate because uh, my family really helped us and, and backed our first little business. and. Uh, I remember we, would, we were looking for a location. We were driving down Brook Street and noticed a uh, to let sign up on uh, this funny little building by Hauncher Venison Yard. And we went and had a look. And it used to belong to Freddie Fox, the milliner, who did all the, the Queen's hats. Uh, we discovered that it was something in the price bracket we could afford. And so we ended up there. And it was just so fortuitous, really, in that, uh, I, you know, it just... From that minute onwards, it was kind of a role we had a lot of luck, you know, being in the right place at the right time. Bianca Jago actually was one of our first clients who wore one of the frothy gowns from the college collection at Studio 54 for her birthday, which was great. It was, and actually that's what started us off because it was pictures of her on the white horse wearing this frothy chiffon silk number, went all over the world and people started flooding in from that point on. The 80s was just the, the best time ever for us because um, ever since Bianca, you know, people were flooding in and we, we had so many very well-known clients. We also were recognised by Vogue at that time. and uh, You see, because we were down the road, they used to ring us up and say, look, we're short of a white suit or, you know, have you got anything that looks, you know, got, got pink buttons on it or things like that. And we'd always help them out. And so we got, had a very, very good relationship with Vogue. And uh, they introduced us one by one to the royal family. But uh, one, one day we were approached by Anna Harvey and they were doing a big shoot with somebody and they wouldn't tell us who it was. They just said, it's very famous, we can't say the name. We're looking for something very elegant, very feminine with a high neck, do you have anything? Uh, as it happened, we did. We'd, we'd, uh, we had this little blouse hanging up, which we'd just made, sent it down there and didn't hear any more, but then found out that was a blouse used for the um, engagement photograph by Snowden of Diana. When we got the commission, actually, it was a very strange situation because I was doing a fitting at the time with this client and the phone kept ringing and nobody was picking up the phone. And I was getting a little bit annoyed because I, you know, I didn't want to sort of... I was right in the middle of complicated pinning and everything. And finally, I picked up the phone, and it was Diana. And uh, she just sort of said, would you do me the honour of making my wedding dress? And it was um, as if time stood still. It was, you know, like one of those life-changing moments. 
and uh, and then she repeated it and almost as if she was expecting me to say well I'd better check the diary or you know I I'm not sure if we can fit you in um, it was unbelievable and of course I I was just so excited and I couldn't let the client know what was happening and I made some ridiculous excuse about my brother's just had a baby ran out the room and she must have heard all this thumping jumping up and down on the ceiling because you know I ran upstairs told David and the girls and we just you know it, it was just an incredible moment and you know from that minute you know our lives were never going to be the same really The day of the wedding was, uh, oh, well, couldn't sleep the night before. Um, it was just frantic. We had to get up very early. We went to Clarence's house where the princess was and the bridesmaids. And Diana was kind of keeping us all very down to earth and calm. And we got her into the dress. And then, of course, there was the long wait until her carriage arrived, which it just seemed to go on forever because she was all in her dress. and. We were standing on the steps waiting and then finally the carriage arrived. We helped her into it and then we were whisked off to St Paul's. And um, of course there was the famous creases in the dress which uh, we noticed as she, she kind of uh, came up the steps and we saw her framed in the doorway of St Paul's. But uh, the fabric that we used was, is a very, very heavy taffeta. And, of course, when you pull it out, all the creases come out. So we weren't... Um, I was more worried than David was, I must say. But, uh, so he got the p top part of Diana and arranged the veil, and I got the hem and arranged the train and the skirt and everything. And then uh, we, we saw a little bit of the ceremony, and then we were whisked back to Buckingham Palace where, where we had to prepare her for the photographs. On the day, Diana was really pleased with it. I think that, that really made our day when we got the phone call when we arrived back at uh, Brook Street. And we were feeling a bit flat, you know, after an incredible day like that. And, you know, oh, well, it's all over now. Now we can sort of relax, but feeling very sad that it was over. And then we got the phone call from Diana. We don't know where she was, but she actually took the time to call us and to say thank you. Now, this is one of my most favourite dresses and made for Elizabeth Hurley for a big party in Russia. And it had a Catherine the Great feel about it. So we made it rather like one of the characters in the old movies all in white silk tulle. This is all beautiful lace, hand embroidered with tiny sequins. It's just so romantic and dreamlike. And then we've taken these beautiful handmade silk velvet roses. Slightly bashed up now because this has um, been photographed so many times. Well, we did another very famous wedding, which was uh, for Richard Branson and Joan. And that was a fun one. I mean, it was just so different. You can't imagine it. Um, and. You know, whatever dress we do, I've got to say, they're all important to us, celebrity or non-celebrity. The thing is, the bride's entrusting us with such a special dress for such a special day that it's brilliant, you know. I, I particularly love it when, when we get a bride that comes in and says, you know, that they don't have no idea what it is that they're looking for. And then we can come up with all these ideas and sometimes they're kind of up for quite wild things as well which could be quite fun. Um, our wedding collection is a, is a mixture of all different styles, but the one thing that they do, do have in common is they're very romantic and very feminine and very frothy. And it's really their starting point for our bride. So they'll come in and, and they'll, they'll look at everything and, and then they just go crazy usually and just try everything on. And, and so that's a starting point. And then they might say, well, you know, I love the bodice on this, but I want something with sleeves or you know, it's like doing a work of art. That's really our philosophy here. It's like painting with fabrics. Now, this is very unusual. It's covered in little silk petals. And then when the wind catches them, or as you're walking, they all sort of seem to flutter and come alive. It's very pretty. And it came out of the blue to do the dress for Chantelle um, and Preston. And that was a lot of fun. And her dress was in this beautiful cream ivory duchess satin. Uh, had a huge skirt, we based it on a crinoline. We did this construction job on it, which we, we'd never actually done before on any other dress. Um, so it kind of uh, was quite a big skirt, actually. I mean, to get through a doorway, she had to kind of move sideways. Uh, we didn't have that long to make it. In fact, we were doing not just Chantal's dress, we did um, Preston's sister as well, and her mum. And so it was a whole family 
thing as well. I've always loved designing for weddings because my, my style is very feminine, very romantic, and it's the ultimate expression of all of that in a wedding dress. But, you know, we've done in between things like the Royal Ballet um, at the Opera House and pantomime. We did Patsy Kenza in Cinderella. We did musicals. Um, I've done lots of clothes for Enya for a lot of her albums. Um, so it's been like a really a big cross-section of things. Now this is something we did with uh, Vogue. This is way back in the 80s, but it was very successful. Um, John Swinnell took all the pictures and they're fabulous. We've got um, various personalities that we were dressing at the time. For instance, Shakira Kane, who's just so stunningly beautiful. Even now, she's just fabulous looking. And Jane Seymour, who we used to dress a lot. I mean, she was beautiful. That was a scarlet Duchess satin dress. I remember that one very well. And Jane Collins, I love this picture of her. And that was very pale pink Duchess satin with the most enormous handmade satin roses around her shoulders. Oh, here's, here's a really lovely one. This is uh, Patsy Kensett, when she was just a child, really. So that was our little brochure that we did with Vogue. I find that my training at illustration is very useful as well particularly, you know, in getting across uh, designs to people because sometimes a design and sketch can be very hard to read. So I use um, my Adobe Photoshop now and got quite good at it, I think. <laughs> and, you know, can draw these dresses and things on what looks like a, a real person. It gives more of an idea, feel of what it is I'm trying to do. I love the movies now, currently into the movies. I think the next best challenge would be to get an Oscar, but I don't see that happening straight away. Now here's the dress that we did for the film Outlaw by Nick Love and made in Silk Duchess satin and we were asked to make two of them because one of them was going to completely get destroyed in the process of making the film. And I do actually feel that that's the way forward, fashion and film together. Um, because in a film format you can control lighting and music and absolutely everything and you get a pure form of what it is you're trying to get across in a collection. And then we've still got to work out how we're going to do the skirt. If I could be remembered for one thing, I think it's just making a mark on fashion to be remembered of, for having contributed something. And uh, I think probably it will be uh, David and I for doing Diana's dress because that was a dress in a million for a person in a billion, really. Um, something never to be repeated, I don't think, ever in history. Uh, it was so unique. So, uh, and I'm glad we could be part of that. Next time on Celebrity Brides Unveiled, former Big Brother star and bride-to-be Grace Adam Short gets into the wedding spirit. Thought I'd look like a real virgin, look, don't I? Look, look how pretty is that? Plus, Wish You Were Here's Ruth England talks about her rush to the altar. The dress itself, it was sort of creamy ivory. I didn't want to go white, white. I mean, let's face it, I was knocked up. <laughs> <laughs>